Thank you very much, Dash. Chronicler, I remember a best of five at Worlds, why I said 3-0 for the team from my region. I was very wrong. It did not go 3-0 my way. I know what it's going to feel like for you at the end of this one here. EDG, the LPL champions. And so far, as far as results have been considered, it is the year of the LPL. RNG, who they took down in the quarterfinals, are the reigning MSI champions. EDG themselves took down RNG in the quarters. And I feel like, from the conversations I'm hearing online, EDG are not getting the credit they are due. No, and I think especially when you look at the whole year, right? EDG were super consistent, doing really well in spring, doing really well in summer, being able to pick up their sixth LPL championship. And I mean, now EDG are aiming for higher heights than they've ever gotten before with making their first semifinals ever. And to me, there's such a big spotlight on the mid lane. Gen G, you know, BDD has absolutely been smashing it here. He has gone above and beyond what has been expected of him. Meanwhile, if you look across at Scout, in the LPL Finals, they were also going against a mid laner that was playing out of his mind, the MVP. And what did Scout do? He also rose to the pressure that was on his shoulders. He played outstanding when he needed to, much better than the rest of the season. So it's going to be a lot around these two already. A couple of bands right there targeted at Scout at that mid lane coming from Gen G. The LeBlanc, the Twisted Fate, no surprises there. His champ pool has encompassed all of the meta champions. Yeah, now I'm curious to see, will EDG go with the rise, which has been left open, which is Scout's other big pick that they know Gen.G don't really play, or I was actually looking at the Lee Sin to be the next up, but no, instantly wanting to go straight towards that Lucian. I mean, this feels like a, a possible Lucian Nami angle. Keep in mind, though, it could obviously be top lane. Flandre has only played Graves and Jace this entire tournament. If you're not going to play Jace, Lucian's kind of next up on the list. And in LPO, they also had that split pushing game with him playing the Lucian top. So definitely a possibility there. Nami's picked up immediately, though. Yep. So as soon as you see that, that is no longer a solo lane. And I need to see not electrocute on the Nami. You are scrapping in this lane. They are fighting back. Your runes need to actually fight back as champions. I need to see an area regarding it. And one thing that already jumps out to me, right, is EDG banned away Graves for his rotation. Now Genji taking away the Jace. Those are the only two champions Flandre's played at Worlds so far. So Flandre going to have to pull out something a bit different. He did play the cannon a few times during the split, so that's always possible. But Flandre is a champion ocean. Yeah, I was looking into that too, and he was 0-3 on all of those cannon games. So I feel like there really is a reason they have not picked Kennen at Worlds thus far here. So it's going to be, this is the true test, right? Uh, on the other side there for Rascal. Uh, going to have to dig a little bit deeper himself. Gen G, neither of their top laners have played the Jace, and so they're always the ones forced to ban it. They haven't drawn any bans itself. So there are these puzzle pieces that have been missing from the pick ban for both teams in their top lane. I'm also surprised that we aren't seeing EDG ban out the Zoe here. Everyone's been hyping up BDD Zoe so far this tournament. EDG, I guess, saying they have an answer if that is the blind pick that Gen.G want to go towards. Yeah, it's either that or the Syndra. It's got to be one of the two here uh, for Gen.G, for him, for the mid lane. May I, they're probably going to just skip and, and wait to see. Then pick top lane first so you can actually get the rebuttal. So looking at EDG's playoff run, the only champions Flandre played that aren't already banned are four Renekton, two Nar, and an Aurelia. Otherwise, he's playing something he hasn't played not only at Worlds, not only not at the postseason, but like way back when. So we'll see what he wants out of the pool. And though he hasn't put it on stage in a while, Ooh. Jax comes through, and I love this as an answer to the Gwen. Yeah, so this is something that Flandre did play only once in the summer split of LPL. But like I said, Flandre throughout his career has played absolutely everything. Back in the day on Snake was known as quite a split push four, so is going to take that, is going to have a favorable matchup. And I'm a bit surprised, Scout coming out with the Orianna, so you do have the ball set up combo there, but going to be a much more passive laning phase coming out from Scout. Oh, yeah, the Seraphine makes it here at Worlds! Oh, Freak, I know you're in love with this pick. Yes! You're, you're definitely in love with the support, uh, supportive mid laners. Seraphine, I mean, to be clear, I think she should be a bot laner more often than not, but I am happy to see players come out and play the support of mids. There is a lot of room for just playing enchanters and buffing up a big carry like a Gwen or a Misfortune. And it does give you so much team fight prowess later in the game. This, this composition scales in crazy ways for Gen G. And when you're looking at this series, a lot of people expecting this entire series to be one of the longer average game times with the way that Gen G do like to play and even how uh, EDG played more in the LPL. Yeah, the one thing I'm really afraid of for EDG in this sense is the Gwen that, that Freak just mentioned, right? Because now having a Lulu and a Seraphine as well, the natural sustain that she has in her kit, I feel like we're gonna get to a point in this game where the Gwen really will be unkillable.
Meanwhile, I actually love the Jax pick into it. These top laners, both of them kind of missing pieces as far as the champion pools, but now so much actual pressure for the win conditions for both of the teams is put in the hands of those top laners, where traditionally for both these teams, it is about the uh, the other side of the map as far as the carries. Nice yeah. little opener here to the best of five. It's one of the things that happens when you play in Channel Supports. Obviously, so much of the reason why we kept seeing Leona and Nautilus and Alistair and such is because they're such good roamers, right? Walk up, land a hook, get a kill that way. Take your level three recall, walk top, get a kill. But these are two of the players that have played a lot of Enchanters. Mako, seven out of his 11 games were on Enchanters. This is now eight out of 12. This is five out of 12 here uh, for life. Like, they're willing to play the less roam heavy, more lane dominant styles, and yet, Someone's gonna get the top lane and tilt that matchup. The thing I am afraid of for EDG is three of their losses have been in Enchanter versus Enchanter matchups in the bottom lane. Enchanters were never really big in the LPL, even when they were big elsewhere. So I definitely think we've seen a bit of uh, not as much comfort coming out from EDG, but both teams looking to posture for a bit of a level one. But it's worth noting, Ruler won his world championship in an Enchanter meta. That was when he rose to the occasion. Bot Diff was the name of that final against T1. And it was a bunch of Lulus and Namis and Janas. That Flash Varus ultimate, yeah. the pick faker towards the end, will always remember that one. And he is. Ruler is the only world champion in this series. Let's see what they do, though. First move was to get that vision control towards the bottom side uh, because it is so important for them. Then roaming B, D, D up through the river. It's going to be an exciting game. And let us know what's going on here. Verizon 5G, all chat. Let us know your well wishes, your thoughts. If you have good puns, they tend to bring them when I'm on cast. <laughs> now, I want to look at a lot of these matchups because it's very interesting. Since we do have two very supportive mid laners here with the Seraphine matchup into the Orion, a lot of farming towards mid. Jungle attention will be drawn to the two side angles here. And we'll have to keep track of building on these minion waves. It's so incredibly important. And especially, as you mentioned, the Jax Gwen matchup. If you can influence this one early and get your scaling top laner ahead, it will have huge, huge ramifications uh, towards the mid stages. If you can get early uh, up there early to the Jax, get the stun onto the Gwen, the setup there is, is critical. And you notice that Rascal has gone for the Ghost. This is something that a few key personas have actually been really trying to hero and champion the use of the Ghost because of the extremely low cooldown compared to Flash. And when Gwen has so much mobility in the kit already with the dash, should give you the extra range to get away from a lot of the Counter-Strike stuns. And with the extra Ghost, it just gives you more frequency of being able to go for those big plays. So we'll have to keep our eyes on Clid when he gets up there to try and combine on those timings. It's oh. also just a lot more useful when it comes to team fighting is, oh, Genji's bottom lane getting such a good trade here, especially for when Mako and Viper were hyped up as potentially the best bottom lane coming into the tournament. Yep. I feel like, at least in laning phase, Mako and Viper definitely not living up to what we saw in the LPL. Got a jungler coming, though. And it's going to be time Level. to try to fight on to Ruler. The Flash, the Exhaust, the Gatos finally up to it, goes off, decent damage on a Ruler. Is it going to be enough now? Flash oh. to follow, beautiful, by Jeja. The shield comes in again, they get the trade kill. Now Life's got some teammates. Double TP coming in now as well as the junglers show up. Scout got to run back, B to D the same. A one for one, both AD carries dead. And they are rewarded for their initiative here. Viper flashes in for the exhaust slow onto Ruler, and they just barely get the first blood money in time. Even though it is answered here, is going to be a, a decent amount of uh, extra control through the through the jungle here for Clid picking up the scuttle crab on the way to the top side. They already have the war there, so should just be traded out. First blood barely cashed in in time there as uh, Viper's the one who takes things into his own hands. Yeah, really nice ease in straight into the flash with the exhaust. We we're talking about EDG's bottom lane not really living up. One person who has it world so far is Jeje. Really nice flash coming out from that to guarantee the knockup, but the damage from life just being too much at the end of it. Still, I think rather nice that Viper was the one to get the kill on their side compared to life for Genji. Exactly. All the money going into the correct place, plus the little bit of extra first blood money is this small advantage there on the side of EG. And that's what you want when you're Lucian Nami lane. You know, burning the summoner spells down there uh, could provide a repeat opportunity. Bubble lands, decent damage. Electric goes off now as well, but Life able to shield up most of it. Worth noting, though, that they got pretty much the same recall because Ruler was up 5 CS before the kill came through. They're still both on double longsword, and the lane should still feel close. 
Yeah, I think a big thing as well was that the wave was actually pushing towards EDG when all that happened. So Viper was able to at least catch up in CS once he did make his way back to lane. And now we're seeing junglers actually path towards opposite sides of the map. So EDG looking like they want to keep punishing this bot side. Tour for Clit, it looks like it's a lot more about covering Rascal on, in the top lane and knowing, hey, that's who these two enchanters are going to be playing around. And he's also, Clit is passing over that ward towards Raptor, so they know exactly where Clit is heading uh, for Flandre on the top side, so he can play it accordingly and try and just slowly stay safe over there. Meanwhile, for the jungle too, I want to talk quickly about the, the flash from the, the Jarvan EQ. It, it can be hard to hit those timings, but when you're going for an EQ on a target you know has flash, you are looking the entire time and your mouse placement is already over their escape path for looking, okay, I need to have the exact timing to flash, make sure I still have my knockup animation of traveling within the EQ. Uh, and so, JJ, big reward there for him to be able to, to make that happen and actually get that first blood. Well played. And for EDG, you're just going to be the one who has to drive forward the early game aggression for EDG. Vettius was pointing out on the AD, but EDG not really a team that, despite their average game time being pretty low, in the first 10 minutes, they are not this action packed team. A lot of their their action and driving the game forward actually comes in the mid game, once we do get things like Rift Herald on the map and Dragon spawning. So for EDG, you can see they're fine leaving Flandre up in the 1v1, not necessarily trying to shut Rascal down, playing through their strong 2v2 and allowing both their soul laners to scale up for later on. Yeah, it's actually pretty interesting to look at where the path for both these teams is headed with, with the scaling, you know, solo laners for the top side for sure. Possible split push, you know, whoever gets the advantage there. But also the team fights are a bit different with EDG going hard on the oh, Viper! Wow. Just deletes Ruler and now maybe a counter again because Rascal TP is down. Level 6 in the Gwen doesn't have the damage. A good slow comes in for Lulu, chasing out as much as they can. Oh. And he's just dodging away. Not going to fight anymore. Crowd Control just let level 5 on the Lee Sin does not mean a kill. EDG get away with a clean murder. Yeah, okay. One drawback of Ghost is you can't flash the bubble. Really well done by Mako there. Lands the peel. This guy has played seven years on EDG. Critical peel for Viper. That is such a big win in two ways. Flandre pushes up on top side. Kept on mentioning the Jax, trying to get some more money into him. Loves it when his opponent actually completes the TP, goes away from his lane, and doesn't get a kill. That coming up hands empty there for Rascal is such a big deal for Gen G. Definitely going to put that split pushing advantage in the side of EDG. Dragon picked up on the other side, though, for Genji. They at least get the consolation prize. Yeah, and I love here that I was just hitting on how I don't feel like we've seen the same lane dominance out from EDG's bot lane that we did see in a lot of LPL games. But here, looks like they're backing off, maybe trying to make them think of uh, recalls coming out and just instantly going for the all in. And this is why people have invested so much into Lucianami at this tournament. Since those changes, Freak, there's just so much damage loaded into all the buffs and synergies you get with Nani. Nami with the extra, uh, you know, damage coming off of Lucian passive now. You can see it there. Just walks him down. You got the slow and he's got the extra damage. So we'll see if they're able to use this bottom lane and really leverage it because so much was talked about Viper uh, with the way that EDG won LPL and how, uh, how dominant he was going to be here at Worlds. So I like how you're alluding to it. Lyric, we're finally getting to see them flex some of these muscles. Yeah, and now has uh, an advantage with the pickaxe in lane to keep looking for these strong trades. But one thing I want to talk about more holistically is BDD's roaming down, but EDG have a ward, so I think they should be fine. Is when we look at this comp, another thing the analyst just hit on was like the damage share on each team, right? BDD, 29% of the team's damage. Rascal, only 20%. This time, Rascal and Ruler are going to have to be the ones to step up. BDD taking more of a back seat to where EDG are still fine to play the way they have been with Flandre being the main damage dealer. Yeah, and, and we have time now to analyze how they're going to work as teams, too, because both of these teams have a lot of synergies in belt in their draft. They're just very different. We've got the obvious Jarvan delivery for Shockwave for Scout, which gives them the initiative and the CC to try and make a Rift Herald play. Mako, though, it's just the root. Mako doesn't have a flash. Get away. Going to buy some time with the tidal wave, but waves goodbye. Can you rush down the Herald in time? Answer is going to be yes. There's the spike for Jeja. And that's going to mean more cash money. Keep in mind, two plays right ahead and top. Flandre can be snowballed off that. Yeah, so nice pickup for EDG, but I actually really like the adaptation coming up from Gen G as JJ finds a knock up. Damage Red's not going to build him some time, though, and Clint going to chase in for a bit more. The kick flash life finds the execution. 
Clint, that was beautiful. Yep, teammate positioning is so much more important in duels in the river than the 1v1, even with the brush advantage there. Clint doesn't back down because he's got the rest of the squad right behind him. Flash used very effectively to get that kick back and gets the kill. The one thing that's confusing to me is the fact that, right, JJ was the one looking for that play. He was sitting in Pixie Brush. You should know Genji have first move because they're the ones who collapsed on Mako and got control of Midway. Yeah, I, I, sometimes when you've got vision advantage like that and you're playing Jarvan, so much is influenced by being able to hit your EQ. So it feels really good as an individual sometimes to make some of these plays where you know you're going to get that big burst of damage. But again, the positioning of your teammates, they to see the mid lane there. Uh, Gen G too close. You can tell JJ, you know, tried to run as soon as he got his damage in, but already too close and well done by Clid to punish him for it, not let him escape after a little bit of jungle trade ego goes down there. Does have a decent amount of ramifications here because a minute and 50 seconds left on the dragon spawn, and Gen G would be extremely happy to set up first there. Oh, I would actually like to see EDG just go for the opposite side of the map, just head up towards top, which is the complete opposite of what JJ is doing right now, pathing towards his bottom side. You do still have that Rift Herald. I mean, three plates up on top lane three, you can probably raise that in just one go. And that even potentially pulls members of Gen.G up towards the top half of the map, which then allows you to pivot down towards bot and get Dragon set up first. You've got a big point of power here with Viper already completing the Gale Force. Very, very big uh, point here for the minute away on the Dragon. And then moving down so much ward coverage, you can tell Genji do want to set up for that Dragon. Just littered the river with control wards. Yeah, we're going to push him yet again. As you can tell, Jarvan is bot side. You called it. He was pathing towards this side of the map. Left up his Gromp and his clear. And well, we know if they want to cross map, this Dragon spawns still in a minute. The Scuttle taken to the bottom side will despawn by that point. As Genji's duo has recalled away. The ward is shared, and EDG, they could crash for turret plates, but I'm not sure they would even get a turret if they summoned Herald here. Yeah, and then meanwhile, they're just going to take the opportunity to go through through River instead and try and try and make a, a little bit of headway here as far as the setup is concerned. Walking over the scuttle, no concern for the extra timing here. Jax is pushing up on top side too. The teleports are a bit desynced though. Rascals is, a, is much further behind than Flandre, so should be a little bit of uh, easier time for EDG to get the opening. Also, when I look at these compositions, I think Genji's comp can win fights very easily if it's on objective first. Just walking into Seraphine and Lulu is so incredibly hard. To where for EDG, I feel like their composition has more options, whether it's playing through a side lane and bringing Flandre down or just brute forcing their way in. Yeah, again, the differences are EDG has a bit more priority because they have very clear and instant initiation. Jarvan into Orianna. The age-old combination there, trying to deliver a shockwave onto the back line, onto those primary targets, whereas Genji are completely counter-engaged here with the Seraphine and the Lulu excelling in a lot of these situations. Whereas you're saying, Lyric, if you have the setup and you have the positioning there, they can have very devastating counter-engages. Other than that, it has to be a crazy play from Clid. Well, here's the big play top side. Flandre got his Divine Sunderer. Yes, they're going to maker, but here comes the summon. They can auto it down to two plates. They've even got an Orianna for good measure. And this should always kill the top lane turret as long as they stick around for a few more moments. They'll get the damage. They'll get the turret. They're choosing to cross map. Now, it's worth noting, though, that EDG have bot pressure because they've got the mythic difference in the AD carry. Exactly, that Gear Force, as we mentioned, going to provide so much more burst damage. And when Lucian Nami uh, can spike really hard at this point, it's hard for them to get anything on the other side. Flandre trying to get that second charge off, but Clid is roaming around, sniffing for something. Just in time, Flandre is able to back off too. So EDG passively gaining more. Yeah, and I'm a bit surprised EDG waited so long to look for the play, but I still think overall it was the right calls. Make your way towards topside, drop that Herald down, and it's going to pull Clid or BDD or whoever up towards topside to look to cover. So now it pulls him away from Dragon. We already see JJ pathing his way down there, and now EDG can once again uh, JJ group up with Mako, walk into River, start clearing out these wards, and then Genji won't have that setup that really makes their composition such a, a hard threat to deal with. And finally, the recalls come through. Misfortune has her own Gale Force. I am reasonably partial to at least some level of crit on the Misfortune. Gonna go in for the play. Double auto. Oh, 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 my word, that is a lot of damage. An execution from Viper's Gale Force. Ruler tried to get away, but Flash was not enough. Viper came to play today, boys. Oh my goodness. Taking the Lucian Nami to extreme levels here. Gets the Flash out of Ruler and the kill down. 
There's no question on the dragon now. Oh, Lisa's gonna lay in the queue. Flash not gonna get too much. Oh, there's too much healing. Tidal Wave's gonna hit on a three, and that might mean a kill. Knock up from Clint. Thank you, Lulu. Barely going to oh. land. Viper's Flash does not get the extra last auto that he needs, and it's going to be a walk away for Clint, but Dragon is here for the taking. And that was so messy, guys. That was all over the place. I thought Scout was gonna go down. Even the EQ from JJ missing the knockup on Clint, but there was just too much healing coming out from the side of EDG. Now they're gonna be able to turn to Dragon first and pick up this objective. For most of this tournament, the early lane stats have been in the favor of Ruler. Almost second in CSD for the early stages at 15, but Viper taking things into his own hands. This is so big for game one of the series too, establishing this level of domination with the Lucian Nami and that as priority, forcing so many plays. A lot of these are just individual here from Mako and Viper. Remember, it's not just the aggressive plays they pulled off. They even avoided the teleport down to their lane without giving a death over to the Gwen. So there's just so much pressure in this game being afforded by how well this EDG bottom lane has been playing. Now the question is, can they transition it to those big big shockwave plays that they need to actually finish out this game. Because everything else is going according to plan. That Jax on top side, uh, gaining the advantage for the split push, getting that tower down, giving him the long lane now. They, they've been able to check all of these early game boxes, but you have to always have that in the back of your head for Gen G. <laughs> what if they stall out? What if they get the, the dream, you know, Seraphine and Lulu kiting out, can't go down with all the sustained sort of team fights? The thing I'm looking at is, Actually, I'm really surprised Genji are gonna opt into contesting this one. Both bot lanes are on the way though, so looks like Genji actually will have a bit of tempo on EDG. Yeah, Genji would want to buy some time for Seraphine ult to come back up. It's very quick here for for BDD. A few more seconds on it, and uh, they're just trying to stall the Rift Herald. All right, Smites, we're looking at here. Eye pops, and there we go. It's gonna be a reset. Back to full HP. Team's coming around. Beautiful stall right there from Genji. Now it is back up. They have the ultimate available. All right, Raph's going to burn his dash over the wall, so we'll be missing one of the steroids if there is a fight to break out. Ruler stepping up pretty confidently. Flashless, but has his ultimate. Will be the first for him of the game. Down a 3k health in the Herald. they got to make sure Clit is around for the smite if he wants to go for it. Not nah, going to be claimed here by JJ. Is there a team fight, though? If you look to find a stun on the two, knock up, knock up, get a fine kick back, hits Mako, and that means Nami falls. Gordrier keeps Clit alive, and a big charm keeps him a little bit longer, but Shockman turns one back around. Viper firing freely. Finds a second kill, exhaust traded, fighting ruler, jumping away, staying alive for a moment. Life flashes, <laughs> and his life flashes before his eyes, as that is Viper dropping. Scout looks for ruler, ruler cannot get out. Auto attack, a shield, you gotta get this kill, he's gonna claim it. One left alive versus two. Yeah, and we see objective going the way of EDG, but that fight coming out from Genji was so nice, especially Clid with the kick, I believe it was on to Flandre into Mako, which locks him in the bullet time, yeah. which pretty much sets up for Gen G to come out with the advantage from this fight, but still extremely close. Only 1k gold lead for EDG. Exactly. I, had so, I was so, paying so much attention to the Jarvan for the initiation there, but it's Flandre who, who as soon as the Rift Herald goes down and you see the eye, he's like, I'm getting that eye. Top laners want the Rift Herald activation. He gets the double stun for the Counter-Strike with that kick onto JJ, as you mentioned, into Mako, and Mako goes down instantly with the Misfortune ultimate. So you get to see BDD tries to peel here inside the pit with just a single on the Seraphine ultimate. But because he only got one and didn't get Viper, a lot of damage done there by Viper and some some extra space gained by dashing over the back of this Baron pit. He forces life to flash after him to finish up the extra kill. And that means Scout inside the pit here is able to finish off Ruler with no flash, even with the extra shield coming through. Yeah, and Again, I think this shows what Genji's composition is capable of when EDG need to fight them in an enclosed space. Of course, having to jump in for that Rift Herald, so you're jumping into things like the Seraphine Ultimate, Lulu being able to ult someone and lock you down, right into Rascal who can pop his W and so hard to lock him down, but EDG, J Viper's still going! Looking for damage, the ruler cannot quite kill, but geez, is that a lot of damage from a fed AD carry. Viper on his way up, moving towards Essence Reaver on his next item there as well. BDD would love to stop the Herald, but can't walk back to the eye. And so it will get the charge down. Now, that's actually, I believe, top and bot lane tier two have both been herald crashed and are not that hard to kill if they get a second push. No, but it looks like instead wanting to go for resets with Dragon up in 50 seconds. So come back out of the map, get some vision down towards the bottom side. Both Scout and Flandre have TP, so if they do want to look to answer sidewaves and set those up, they're completely fine to do so. And back to your point on who gets to the objective first. It's so hard for Gen G to face check 
because they're the ones that are walking into the possible shockwave combination. You know, Nami tidal wave by itself, very unassuming. But when you get to throw it with vision advantage through jungle corridors and you've got a Jarvan Orianna combination, uh, there's a lot of CC that you can actually combine. And Genji, you can tell the priority here on trying to get that setup is huge. Moving in, Clid's actually able to get an advanced ward as well. So here we go, dragon number three of the game as the gold is close, 2.4 thousand EDG. Dragons are split, but Genji walking to the pit, double control just to make sure that trigger ward can't see anything. But EDG are grouped up, everyone's here, scout TP'd in, and we get another chance at a five on five. Be careful for EDG not to funnel up for the big Seraphine ultimate. If you get multiple people hit by that, the misfortune will destroy you. you need to spread out. Scout claims the scuttle, the extra vision, still Genji playing on their controls, but there's one of the brush behind them, so they're still in full vision. EDG know what's going on. Dragon pulled back yet again. Smite still up for both players, 900 apiece as it is in this year of League of Legends. Dunk comes in, Shockwave on the two. Lee Sin gets the Gore Drinker, and the Spike comes in. Okay, second Dragon for EDG. Flandre kiting back, his dot zone is down. Rask would love to keep the chase going. Get some decent damage, kick back, will not kill Viper. Clint is on the chase, Clint gets the kill. Will he trade his life? Not just yet, BDD's there to support him. Gets the root, gets a lot done, and now we get the rest of the squad chasing in. Beautifully done, Gen G find two kills. And it is BDD who lands the snare on two Viper, the double root right there, ensures they can actually kill him. Clid following up with the Q, and that means they transition to Baron Lyric. Yeah, and out, out of nowhere, I mean, Gen G were kind of slowly looking like they were going to be bled out of this game with the map control that EDG had. But really nice fight coming out from Gen G. I also feel like EDG did sacrifice team fight setup to just be able to take the dragon. I like the initiation, you know, the JJ attempt at baiting out the long cooldowns. He, he goes in with the Cataclysm for the Shockwave play and immediately he queues out. But Genji didn't bite on that, you know, they didn't waste any cooldowns. And holding them, they're able to actually turn it around afterwards. So big rewards for patience here, I feel like, for the team fighting of Genji. And let's look at this, because uh, the entire time they're looking at trying to get one of these double openers for the Shockwave combo. JJ has his eyes on Clid. He EQs back after the Shockwave to get to the Dragon. They burst it down to get their objective, but the response. BDD whiffs the ultimate on Viper, but then lands the Snare! And so then it allows Clid to flash in for the play, and they get the guy that has been carrying so hard for EDG right off the bat. Uh, and I think it just goes to show, right, that had, had EDG, I think, sacrificed some of the setup in the top and bot side wave, gotten there first, it could have been a, a very different fight. But Gen.G now are doing such a good job of stalling these out, like you said, not taking the bait. And I think this Baron is a complete game changer because now they're going to have push with the Baron dot minions. Now they're going to be consistently able to get vision and set up. And now it's going to be EDG who are going to have to face check in with things like the Jarvan and the Jax. I got to say, I was so worried for BDD and and uh, and Gen.G. As soon as he whiffs the ultimate, but then being able to land the follow up there is, is just pulling a hat. Uh, out of nowhere there for him. So now with Baron, this actually empowers the Gwen to be able to split push, which has been, been an issue with the Jax previously. All right, well, as we wait to see what Genji can do with their Baron push, we get Cloud9 Enthusiast saying, Bruler has quite a few deaths this game. Guess he's not measuring up. Thank you, as always, Production, for bringing us the uh, puns anytime I'm casting. That's a solid uh, 12 out of 12, as uh, I'm American and our rulers go to 12 inches, so. Uh, fan of that one. Now a fight in the top side. Rascal oh, getting wow. towered though by Flandre, but the sustain is high from Gwen. Can't get more done just yet. Still really nice for Flandre to bait out, you know, the ultimate. Bait out so many key abilities from the side of Gen G, and also making it harder for them to commit to their push when they have to worry about Rascal getting dove in a side lane. Yeah, it's just a huge item advantage for the split push here for Jax. You know, Flandre did get the extra help to get ahead early, but on Play of the Ruin King plus Divine Thunder, he's playing into Rascal, who has actually gone for uh, components of a zone which is a lot more for creating space for team fights rather than fighting the split push. So Genji have opted for, yeah, Rascal, you just can try and you know hold some of these side lanes, catch the waves, and and rely on the team to to make that big team fight play. He's got the stopwatch for the activation, then we'll be able to upgrade to Azonias after it breaks. All right, we are uh, seeing a Last Whisper build out of Ruler, despite the fact he's only against one set of steel caps. Uh, it's not going to be the most efficient compared to a, a lethality look. You know, that's the way the math works out. 
And if they're going for more than steel caps, we're looking at more of a uh, armor pen kind of style, but it will let him scale on towards three and four items if it goes much later. It's just not the power spike, but it's a scaling option. Midland's still under fire, but it's worth pointing out this Red Bull Baron power play less than the Baron itself. EDG has done a really good job of clearing the waves out, not bleeding a single turret, and in fact, knocking down top. I say that Midland's going to die here. <laughs> but still, it, the, the point still stands that it is less than the Baron itself in gold, so EDG has done a good job of playing the map despite being down a Baron buff. And I think it's because they have such strong components from their early game. Remember the, the win conditions of the Jack split push as well as the, the bottom lane domination early. They achieved both of those, so you still get the rewards later into the game. Uh, even though they did lose at the Dragon with Viper going down, they've still been able to return to it. So Jax, Flandre there does get another one. I also feel like we're seeing something that a lot of us knew to expect when coming into the series that it could be a bit slower in the mid game. It can just come to Dragon stacking and be all about team fights. So I wouldn't be surprised if we just saw teams keep going back to these compositions, things with the Orianas, the Jaxes, the scaling on the opposite side for Gen.G as well. A lot of looking ahead we were thinking in this series, you know, it's going to be a marathon, not a sprint. Take your time. Oh, we get the next scuttle going down, and guess what? It's going to be Dragon's Soul Point if claimed by EDG. No Baron to cross for two minutes. And now that they own the Raver, looking for the play early here on a clip. Forces him to jump back to a minion to stay alive. Always has that cooldown available, but it still forces him back a bit farther. Blue Trigger used to spot the brush. Yes, indeed, EDG are camping it. And so Flutter gonna rush this one down. JJ here to help out as well. And EDG can blitz this thing down. Gen G could contest pretty soon. They'll kill it first. Will there be a team fight? Looks like that answer is gonna be no. Yeah, it's so scary again to, to face check as this team for Gen G. They don't have a great one. I guess, uh, you know, with the stopwatch plus the Zonias now, Rascal's got two uh, immunities that you can do. So Gwen, that, and W. Quite a few buttons to buy time with. Uh, and now, I mean, we're going to be looking for the side of EDG, right? Getting to that soul to be their main win condition. For Gen G, I think pivot up towards topside, start getting some vision down for when the next Baron does spawn. Then we'll probably see a, a bit of a Baron dance and how well EDG can navigate that with the Jack split push. And of course, uh, Flandre will still be able to win out against Rascal with the item advantage that you hit on earlier. But, yeah. I mean, Zanya's finally done. You have both summoners up for Rascal. You pretty much have all summoners up on both sides. So. If any kind of explosive team fight does break out, I feel like Gen G can start to feel pretty good about the power spikes they're hitting. Still on scaling. 2,000 gold. We had that gold difference last time around, and it turned into a Baron for Gen G. Uh, that said, uh, we're looking at Dragon Soul in four minutes if E to G continue to have map control. It's been not too bad so far. I have a fire cannon coming in for the Lucian next up for the dash double auto. That'll be plenty of damage for a little bit of early single target burst. Flandre towards his third item as well, has had the pickaxe for a while. I assume he's building towards Sterix. And since he's got really no other item slots, he just needs that whole 3,000 gold to finish that item. <laughs> yeah, Flandre is going to try and push this split strategy as hard as EG possibly can because they know that Gen G's sights are set on these late game, group up with our double supports for, for those long team fights where we have so much sustain and crowd control to work with. But the extra leverage coming from Flandre, almost the level 16 on the Jax, teleport ready as well. Swapping him, you can tell, moving up through mid so that he can still switch to, to the top lane uh, if there is no fight towards mid. He's kind of covering for the possibility here and yet still being able to divert the attention over towards Baron. All right, Rapid Fire Cannon in, double auto into ulti. That slow can off make it look pretty decent, but hold on. Gonna push Clid back now as well. Short cooldown as he jumped to a champion. But we are looking for top river control here. Flounder gonna grab the scuttle. And we know that Baron could be rushed down rather quickly by a Jackson Illusion. Oh, Midwave Viper? being fought over. And BDD is almost out of mana. Now he has spell book, and I don't know if he can get to clarity in time to make that look good, but it is EDG controlling mid, and they've got the inside track on mid tier two. But they're chasing for kills. I'm not sure what they're gonna get. I don't believe they can lock them down. Maybe but come back up towards mid now. The reason they're chasing so much is because they want to take advantage of BDD so low on mana. And you can tell Viper, with this build, going for the rapid fire cannon, he keeps dashing in aggressively for this extra damage. He's such a confident player in his own movement. Ooh, snare. Yeah, but he's so tanky. Keep in mind, he has gotten solo turret for the get last Oh, Viper, he gets hit! Huge charm, and Viper just goes down! Oh, that man has been defanged. A kick into the wall. Scout gonna stay alive for now. Clint to be shockwave back. Goes in far. Gordrick on a three. Staying alive for the moment. Rascal sniping. Can't quite find those. Flandre finally goes down. And yet again, it's Gen G finding two kills and turning for a Baron. And BDD yet again makes a 
a critical pick for the team. Viper has been so confident in his movement freak, but he does not flash the ulti there. BDD gets a pick and Genji get a bear. And it's crazy because we were questioning if BDD can have the same impact when oh. he is on the supportive champion, but it doesn't matter. He's the one finding the lockdown to set up for the damage coming out of the rest of Genji. Bubbles, charm, sleep, stuns. Give this man some crowd control freak yep. and he's gonna work some magic. Uh, Viper, though, has got to be kicking himself. He is the pick that has turned these fights sour for his team. Once again, you can see him. Just watch for Scout. Once Great again, flash yeah. ult, tries no. to dodge, doesn't flash it. He, he just ease in, and once again, Genji finding a good opportunity. Gives me flashbacks to the Ezreal game he played the other day, where once he got locked down by RNG, Clid finding a great opportunity to get onto Scout, but nice job by EDG to peel back. Clid's still going to be able to get out alive, while on the opposite side of the fight, Genji are taking down Flandre. There's quite a awareness there by BDD. They've got the control ward in the Raptor brush, so he flashes right up for it. Hits the target, goal achieved, and Genji wearing purple again. Let's see if they can do better uh, on the gold score this time, yeah. Freak, for you. I, I would say the last the last uh, Baron went plus one tower to EDG. EDG got top and bot tier two, and, and Genji only got mid lane outer. Big difference this time, though, is the soul coming up for EDG. 20 seconds away, and again, they've got early vision advantage, trying to utilize the control wards here through the river to their advantage. Genji are threatening the push, but EDG, no. We've got the upper hand here. We've got the soul to draw you in. We're gonna take some poke EDG, have more summoners, four flashes up to the two of Gen G. So repositioning could be a huge factor here. Flandre sitting in the wings. JJ, of course, knows he's the primary front line, but now being zoned away, Rask going for the, the pushback. Oh. Viper getting kicked. Viper flashes and stays alive. Health bar is low. We'll be able to dash across the wall. Lee Sin drops and Viper this time around. Saved his summoner spells for the right time. This is how you do it. Getting away from the skill shots. Charm is going to miss. And EDG looking for the Dragon Soul. A dunk out of the back line. Gore Drinker and a stopwatch for JJ. Ruler's got nowhere to go. Finally flashes and burns the stopwatch. And that is now Dragon Soul claimed. And the the big thing for EDG was this time they adapted. They realized, hey, our main job is peeling for Viper. Genji thought they saw the angle. Clid and Rascal thinking they have enough burst. But like you said, Freak Viper this time around using his summoner spells. And the rest of EDG were just there to peel off. The other three members of Genji not able to follow off with Flandre doing a nice job of zoning. And so once again, a Baron power play that it might look okay in gold, but it's EGG getting more done on the map with the Dragon Soul and a very small gold lead. You have to believe they're the leaders in this game. Once again, look at the folks on Viper, look at them out play it. Yeah, they want to try and recreate the success they just previously had, but JJ helps out peeling for him, flashes with the Jarvin EQ. He's able to dash away, uses his own flash to gain space, and then the culling down while they wait out the stopwatches, wait out the timing, pick up their kill onto the Gwen as well. The re-engage? Doesn't have the immediate follow-up, but eventually get the threat there with the Shockwave from the Scout to force the double cooldowns as well. Also feels like the big point, right, was to cataclysm, cataclysm them, JJ get out and just be able to secure that dragon for yourself to make sure that you do have soul. So really nice job coming out from EDG. So we do have a game pause. This is uh, Gen G, as I've been informed. Clid sadly spilled water on his desk. Tell me about world-class junglers and spilling water on their keyboards. You know, like, we had Sven Skarin a while back, Spill Skarin, as he was affectionately known. Now Kliz doing it too. I mean, just, it's just shameful. <laughs> it's, all, it's always the junglers. <laughs> yeah, it's always the junglers. Uh, but I got to point out, like, because uh, I've had a very critical eye on Viper in this game because, yes, he has been the one who got caught out in the last two team fights they lost. This one is well done. This is the window you get when the jungler doesn't have flash. If Lisa has flash, he lands the Q, and he starts the R. Now you're rooted. He flashes behind you, and you don't have counterplay. It's actually always going to land on you. In this case, though, he had to ward hop because flash was down. That meant you wait for the Q to land, then you dash backwards. That means the kick is sending you sideways, and you're able to survive that fight. You saw him kite that one pretty well. So well done to Viper in that team fight. Yeah, okay, Lee Sin landed a Q, but played the rest of it really well. Yeah, and I think a lot of it goes back to... Again, we've seen kind of some ups and downs from Vipers because even this gives me flashbacks to their series against RNG where he played the Ezreal in one game and was continuously eing forward and getting caught out. But this time around, again, amazing laning phase coming out from him. Has been a bit more aggressive in the mid game, <laughs> being a bit more Jackie Love uh, reminisce to, to people who watch the LPL. But still, such massive damage numbers coming out in this game and solidifying this soul for EDG. Yeah, and it's one of the big things that we're looking at this Gen G composition and wondering if they were going to have to rely on Clid to make some big 
plays to have initiative. Uh, other than that, I feel like you can't always count on BDD landing these stairs right onto uh, Viper. That should not be the norm for the team. So Woo! that play is going to be incredibly important. No Eric's down, Eric's. Chase, ulti, and he's out of shields. That is a lot of ability power, and now the dunk on the BDD has a flash. Bullet time comes down. Tide Wave's going to hit there as well, and BDD able, barely, barely able to slink away. Perfectly timed bubble. Absolutely no way out for Rascal. Teleports to his doom. I, individual picks have determined the game, Lyric. Yeah, much over and over again. I mean, nice from EDG. Viper spotting the moment to go on Clint. All of EDG's members are there to fall up on Rascal. Doesn't matter that BDD does once again hit another skill shot and actually does lock Viper down because EDG just had more members alive. So great there from Scout in the side brush. He immediately shockwave on Clint. The follow up there from Viper. And then forcing it through the teleport timing from Rascal is just a dream for Mako. Easy for him to time that one. Uh, you know, it's pretty easy also to aim. You'll always teleport end up between where you're teleporting and your nexus. So he's able to hit that bubble, no problem. Picked up the extra kill, and their reward is destroying so much of this base. Now it's just wide open for the return from EDG. Yeah, it's crazy that they're only 3k gold apart. And this game is always from close to gold, right? It's always from between 1 and 3,000. But it does feel like for a large majority of it, EDG have had map control. Gen G have just done a phenomenal job of finding certain picks that have brought them back in the game. And now when we're at a point where it's three minutes until Elder, if you find that one pick in three minutes, Gen G can win the game. Yeah, Scout had definitely been doing work. He's the one who started everything on Clid in the river. He's the one, 5-0-2 with 700 gold bounty on his head and death cap completed. He's definitely putting that damage to good use. I also think it goes to show how versatile Scout is because Scout is not only a player who can play things like the LeBlancs and the Assassins or the Rise of Twisted Fates, things that have been banned against him so often, but Scout has shown throughout his whole career since 2016 summer when he joined EDG that this man can play absolutely anything. Exactly, so much time with this organization. Uh, he, he truly is a uh, regime player here for EDG, along with Mako. Both of them careers, basically, here. Besides the uh, substitute time on T1, so much invested by Scout in EDG and in the LPL. Yeah, but bringing it back, right? I mean, EDG, they they won their very first three splits in the LPL and they incorporated back in the clear love days and, uh, you know, such a well-known player. But it's it's the really recent times that have brought them back on top. They hadn't been at Worlds in a while. This is their first ever World Championship semifinal, and it's bringing in the new blood. Jijit is the youngest player left at the World Championship. He's 20 as of four days ago. Like, the man is, and he's stepping in for clear love of all players. And hey, you know what? He was the gank that got first blood. He's been such a big factor making these team fights work. And, and EDG slinking on their way towards the world final. Yeah, and they're gonna try and do it by having the vision set up for this fan, trying to find picks. Oh, everyone's grouped up. JJ does not go for the flash ulti. I know players who would have went for that play and said, I think my team will follow up, but holds back for now. Baron's still on the plate. I believe every ward in the pit is turned off by control wards, so gonna be rushed down now. And again, their damage is so incredibly high. Four out of Lucian. Flyder the rune keeper wants to deal damage. He's gonna spot Clint though. Can they zone him out? Because Ward's gonna go into the pit. Now they know. Gonna get a bit of damage. And Clint, oh. here comes the dunk. He's gonna flash back out. BDD locked in place. Does not have a flash. Does not have a stopwatch. Does not have a life anymore. Speaking of him, down to 100 health as well. As it's gonna be Gen G running away. Do you turn back to Baron or do you find this kill in the Clint? I feel like for EDG, it's simple solution. Just turn back to Baron. Looks like what they're gonna do. Flandre can keep just playing keep away. He even sells his flash up and is quite safe. This is oh, a lot Clint. of damage. You can kill him. Oh, the flash to safety for a second, though. Flandre gonna have to jump away, gonna flash, and he gives me back up in a second, but he's still zoned away. The jungler, Clid, is not even across the mid lane again. The third Baron of the game is gonna go to EDG, the last hope of the LPO. And the timing of this, there's only 43 seconds left on the Elder Dragon, so Baron empowered recalls. You get to go back, spend your money, Grab your control wards before the Elder Dragon comes out. It's perfect timing. 30 seconds to get over there for the setup, and you're going to have super minions moving up mid. Right, for EDG, it feels like everything's there. You're going to have push. You're going to have vision. You have uh, more items on team members like your jacks up in top side. For Gen G, your one condition at this point feels to me is a steal coming out from Clid or some kind of nice pick if some member of EDG does walk too far forward. No flashes on a ton of members on the side of Gen G. Ruler doesn't have flash life. Clid, Rascal didn't have flash at the start of the game. So there's a lot of easy pickings for EDG. Here we go. Whoever gets this dragon is likely to win the team fight itself. Is it going to be up to end the game? We'll have to see. Still two minutes left on the Baron buff. 
So EDG not only have Soul, not only have the gold, they did the extra stats from the Baron here as well, as the Dragon goes down to 10k. BDD waiting on the sides. Does have a flash, could get a huge ulti, because Jax is hitting mid, by the way. Yep, Flatrace in base, and he's at the Nexus turrets. They had to send Rascal back. Can he even cover the Jax? The Nexus turrets are melting, and, and they're, they're teleporting! And Scout, they're trying to end it now! Let her leave a man behind! Shockwave gonna be Zonius, <laughs> but the Nexus will fall! We have seen these fights before, and yet again, the LPL wins the base race! Game one goes to EDG! Love the ending call there from EDG. They utilized Flandre so well this entire game. Split pushing prowess really finds its name in lights here at the end where he's at the Nexus turrets, even with the Gwen in his face. Counter-Strike burning those things down and they commit the teleport to finish it off. Great opener from EDG. Yeah, I mean, especially seeing the base race is such a throwback. I do not know how many base races I've seen this year in the that, LPL because there's too many to count. That was not a race. That, that, that was, was literally <laughs> just them just crashing down the door yeah. and, and Genji are at the Dragon. It was just the qualifying lap, you know, got yeah. pole position. You're ready to go for the actual race itself. Oh, fastest time? Cool. Uh, everyone's behind me. Sounds good. But I'm so glad we got to see a game play out this way, right? Because I've been waiting and waiting and waiting for like the counter picks and the Gwen to boy the matchup to play through that lane. He got every single tier two turret solo pushed, knocked down mid lane the rest of the way through, basically solo pushed. It was all about the jacks. And the end of the game, I don't care the KDA, he won the game. Genji have been most criticized for sitting and waiting and not being proactive. And they mm -hmm. drafted a composition that does a lot of sitting and waiting. And it's important for the series that EDG are able to punish that. Even though they got caught a couple of times, they still kept looking for these plays. They were confident to push ahead with the advantages that they had. So uh, I think that bodes very well for them. Yeah, and I, I think EDG felt like they were in control of the game pretty much the whole time despite the, the slim gold lead. But still, I think this game shows us that this actually can be and probably will be a very competitive series. Genji were consistently punching back and finding picks. It's going to be a fun one. I can't wait to see more games in this series. And remember, wait for more Worlds 2021. Be sure to check out Gen G's Teams Picked as the song that represents their play style All In by Jay Park, PH1, and Groovy Room, alongside the play style picks of all our teams on the official LOL playlist on Spotify. See you soon. The new Axe Effect. Red Bull gives you wings. Inside your brain 
Not afraid to die. Type to make you cry. Type to put a price. All up on your head. Do just what I said. Watch it fill you full of dread till you go <sighs> Is it really a surprise if I'm playing with your mind And I treat you like a prize and I throw you to the side And am I really that bad if I love to make you mad And get happy when you're sad, only care about a bad In control, that's how I like it and I'm never letting go No, never had a soul So you ain't digging nothing from me when you go Inside your brain And take you somewhere far away Time to roll the dice You know I'm the type Type to risk my life Not afraid to die Type to make you cry Type to put a price All up on your head Do just what I said I'm a straight up villain Straight up villain Yeah, no feeling, Yeah, no feeling. Welcome back to the State Farm Analyst Desk, where EDG have managed to eke this one out, win the first game in our series, and I'm here with Chronicler and Azale to break down their path to victory. Vettius, as you can see there, he'll be joining us in a moment to break down some of the team fighting that took place. And starting the draft, because as we expected with both of these teams, uh, there would be different approaches to what we saw yesterday. And immediately, Chronicler, a few of the things that jump out to me is uh, BDD, the, the playmaker of the team, Get shoved on a seraphine. I honestly, I love the seraphine. I don't think that uh, the seraphine specifically was the problem. Cool thing to me about this draft is that a lot of people were forced off comfort. We see the Syndra, the Azir ban. We see uh, the Ophelios for ruler. Uh, Flandre not being able to play either the Graves or the Jays. So there is a lot of new stuff happening here, which I think is cool. And I hope that as we get deeper into the series, we see a similar development to that what we saw last, uh, or yesterday rather. Um, that being said, Genji's comp, good at team fighting, not very good at making sure that the team fights happen. Uh, whereas EDG, uh, especially with the lead they were able to get early, uh, really ran the game from start to finish. I mean, that's, that's one of the things that's immediately going to jump out to me as well as outside of the, uh, you know, the draft itself and the, the idea that people were shoved off of comfort. It's the fact that EDG had the advantages in the early game or at least the yeah. avenues to make stuff happen. Absolutely. I mean, they were able to create a lot of advantages through, through bot lane, through 2v2, through you know, jungle pressure coming down there. Um, but one of the things, like, while I, I, I agree with Chronicler that Seraphine is a good pick, and I think that they had a very strong 5v5 draft. I think we saw the importance of BDD not being on a supportive champion, where he is reliant on his teammates to actually make those plays and find those picks. And I felt like Clid and Rascal really kind of fell flat in the later stages of the game. I felt that they should have been able to win some of those 5v5s, in particular the one around the soul. And when you look back to so many Gen G games, you think about the defining moment, it was always BDD doing something. BDD finding the seat, BDD finding the pick, BDD getting the kill. And in this situation, he can't do that on Seraphine. He has right. to depend on his teammates and, and, and ramp up his teammates, and it's great at doing that. But I mean, 
In they some ways, he still did manage to find a couple playmaking a moments, couple. which is what's so phenomenal about him as a player on a pick like Seraphine. But uh, you mentioned it. The early game was all about the bot lanes for both sides. It was just EDG, the one with the onus. They were, they had, you know, the, the first foot out the gate, and it was about Genji trying to cover for the aggression that EDG bot brought rather into the bot lane. At the end of the day, though, Viper coming up big. And I'll recall for everybody here, Chronicler, that this was our featured matchup presented by Mercedes-Benz. It was Ruler versus Viper. And very clearly in uh, the uh, initial game here, um, it's, it's Viper and with him, Mako, that looked way stronger. Um, able to both absorb pressure, find kills in the 2v2, and outside of the very early laning phase where we saw a little bit of prior for Gen G, Ruler and Life were basically permanently shoved underneath their turret. And I think that this continuous lead allowed EDG to get into the position where even when we saw Gen G find a good team fight or two, there wasn't really any room for capitalization. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think one of the biggest parts as well is not just that they got ahead in the 2v2, is that it actually affected the rest of the map, right? We saw Gwen in that last uh, replay TPing down to bot lane, TPed away from a wave that was at his tower, losing plates, losing farm, losing experience while the Jax is getting fed, and that kind of sacrifices any strength you have in the 1v1. Yeah, massive lead on the AD carry himself, netted a massive lead for EDG through the early game, stacking dragons, totally in a winnable position in this one. But to better understand how Gen.G made this a game through team fighting, we got Avedius standing by. So, you already heard the analyst that's talking a little bit about BDD, and I'm going to put a spotlight on him as we get into the team fights because their composition was very strong when it came to the scaling. But I really want to highlight how, in particular, Genji were able to actually come out on top. So, as Genji is looking to set up and contest around this objective, the person that I want you to pay attention to is this man right here, BDD, because he is going to continue to set up these picks. So, as EDG is threatening, they have this initial engage come through from JJ and then the shockwave on to BDD this primary target. He ends up getting forced out thanks to his flash. And then initially you're thinking, oh, this could be a good fight for EDG. But this is where you see the fight start to get a little bit split because Flandre dives in, the ultimate comes through. EDG don't feel like they can fully commit. But then again, keep your eyes on this player, BDD right here as the root lands onto Viper. This is where all of the money is. The Jax threat is being forced out of the side of the fight, and meanwhile, he can actually get shut down. This then sets up Clid to be able to get the kick in, they're able to get the capitalization, Viper ends up dropping, and then once all of your gold suddenly disappears, this team fight becomes very winnable for Gen G. And again, that was all set up by BDD at the beginning of the play. So let's jump over to our second clip where we're gonna see the same thing. Flandre, after looking to try and secure the tier two tower in the mid lane, ends up trying to retreat through his jungle. BDD is looking for picks. And I really wanted to keep an eye on what BDD is doing here because he sees, thanks to the vision provided by Misfortune, that Viper is actually going to jump over this, uh, that Viper is dashing in and he's gonna get collapsed on. So he flashes, flashes in after, throws the ultimate in and is end up going to secure secure that kill with the MF ultimate as well. Even though BDD was not on a champion that actually allowed him to be that hyper carry, to really set up for his team, he was still able to set up his team for so many incredible plays. And in my opinion, Dash, this was Genji's game to lose. Uh, well, okay, so there we go. That I think is a precursor to again, where we were at in the game when it did feel like Genji finally wrestled it back. Absolutely, and I think one important thing to highlight, you know, Vedius is breaking all that down, is that the team was there as a squad and the front line is getting shielded up and buffed up by these enchanters. And I think that is somewhere uh, that they fell short in some of the, the fights that they were actually losing later on in the game. Well, so that's where we would look towards the soul and yep, the multiple the elder especially. fights from that point onward, where it was maybe some individual mistakes by Clid, uh, you know, and Flandre, per, uh, perhaps not Flandre, my bad. Um, Rascal. Rascal, thank you, on the other side. Yeah, from Rascal. Uh, you know, uh, to, to end up kind of throwing this game away from a winnable position uh, for Gen G. But Chronicler, uh, to me, by all accounts, this just points to the fact that we are going to have a very close series that, as expected, is going to come down to team fight. Uh, yeah, and I think that the one thing that EDG did way better overall was the power that they had in terms of sideline pressure. I thought they played right flung there really, really well. They punished a lack of engage from Gen G. And either I want to see Genji have a comp with more engage, or I need to see BDD on a pick that, as Azil pointed out, actually has agency. Because otherwise, the late two objectives, their setup isn't the greatest, their team fighting mm -hmm. is still good, 
but that in of itself isn't going to be enough. All right, well, if Gen Z want to even this one up, they'll have to do it from the blue side of the map. We are just minutes away from game two, but first we sat down with the teams prior to today to hear their thoughts on the semifinals in, the inst in this installment, rather, of the Oppo Cam. Well, first, really, the first one is really good. I think it's really good to get a lot of money in this game. 그거를 가능하게 하려면은 일단 이 상황부터 이겨야 될것 같습니다. 일단 옛날 기억이 나는 것 같아서 기분이 좀더 새롭고 좋은 것 같고 어, 4강 때더 잘할 수 있을 것 같습니다. 我觉得打完安吉之后其实我们现在状态我觉得还是蛮不错的我觉得还是挺大信心能击败根吉或者C9然后就觉得 저희 팀 되게 무서우니까 좀 조심하십시오. 